Good morning. It's Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. Um, our text today is from Matthew chapter 6, Jesus' uh, short uh, teaching of the Lord's Prayer. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This then is the reading of Matthew 6, 9 to 13. And our great end of the church for today is the promotion of social righteousness. That's the only great end or goal or purpose of the church we haven't talked about yet. It is possible that when you hear that phrase, the promotion of social righteousness, that some of you are inwardly rolling your eyes about politically correct, liberal, woke, new stuff being foisted on the Christian church. This is probably where I should tell you that the great ends of the church were added to the Book of Order in 1910, long before any of us were born. You will notice that the promotion of social righteousness speaks of righteousness, not justice. The two words, justice and righteousness, are closely related, especially in the Hebrew prophets, but they are not identical. Righteousness means to be in conformity or harmony with God's ways. The orientation of righteousness is toward God. We not only study God's ways and practice them, but we pray for God's spirit to continually refine and change us so that we may become more and more Christ-like. The orientation of justice is outward toward other people. It has to do with fairness and seeing that everyone is treated equally. It also has to do with law, punishing those who practice injustice. But you can see that the uh, two ideas are very similar. If I am practicing righteousness, trying to live a godly life, trying to be more Christ-like, then of course I also want to live in a just society. Of course I am concerned about fairness. This is why the prophets speak about the importance of merchants using correct and accurate scales and measures so that no one is cheated in the marketplace. They often speak of the need for judges who will decide with equity for the poor, rather than judges who decide for the rich who may reward them. The prophets constantly speak about the importance of caring for the orphan and the widow, because those people start from a lesser position. They had less legal rights, less resources, and less control over their lives. Prominent Christian Jim Wallace tells the story of how he had a group of eager first-year seminary students scour the Bible for every reference to wealth and poverty, to injustice and oppression, and to what God expects from us as a response to injustice. They discovered several thousand verses on these topics. They found justice for the poor and the vulnerable to be the second most prominent theme in the Hebrew scriptures, what we usually call the Old Testament. The first theme was idolatry, and the two were often interrelated. In the New Testament, one of every 16 verses is about the poor or the subject of money. In the first three books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's 1 in 10, and in Luke, it's 1 in 7. One of the students took a pair of scissors to a Bible and tried cutting out all the verses having to do with these themes. The result was a falling apart mess that couldn't hold together a testament to the centrality of these concerns in the Bible. Jesus clearly cares about doing the will of God. Jesus clearly cares about the poor and the needy, as well as the sick and the prisoners. We are to love God. We are to love our neighbor. To love our neighbors is like loving God, closely akin to it. To love people is to be godly. In the Lord's Prayer, we say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. We also say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. We have a relationship with God that is righteousness, and we work on making it better. We have a relationship with other people that is justice, and we work on making it better. 
It should be obvious to anyone studying the Bible and the history of our faith that the promotion of social righteousness as a great end of the church is a very normal thing, humdrum almost. Yet it is not obvious to everyone and may be less obvious today than it was 20 or even 10 years ago. Now, why is that? Well, for one thing, we live in a polarized political environment. It really doesn't matter what I propose, be it feeding the hungry or starting a jobs program or suggesting that the poor need health care or talking about the need for personal responsibility. Before anyone tells me if they agree or not, they first want to know what party I belong to. If I am on their team, they might agree. If I'm on the other team, not so likely. What I want to do is say that I am on Jesus' team. Surely I think that will explain me in a nonpartisan way. Nope. What Christian team do you pray for? Are you liberal or conservative? And when they ask this, they suspect my answer about Christianity will squarely line up with the political parties. So they're asking about my faith is mostly a way of repeating the original question. But I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. Every human being has intrinsic value as someone made in God's image. God loves them, therefore we love them. Therefore we want a society which is full of justice. That is our motivation. And I pull out historical examples like the struggle to end slavery. I point out how faith leaders mustered compassion from the citizenry toward the slave based on the idea of our common humanity. The same occurred with civil rights and women's rights. The basic argument was identical. We are all the same. Any oppression of any person because of some external characteristic is unacceptable. If we are all loved by God, if we all have inalienable rights given us by our creator. I have a dream, said Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., that my four little children... <clears throat> will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by their character. Having invoked the famous line from the famous sermon, I stop and look around, expecting to see nodding heads. And perhaps I don't see them from many people. There are shouts from some professors demanding that I sit down and shut up. I, a cisgender white man, have no standing to speak on such things. I am a beneficiary of an oppressive culture. I have had and do have a great deal of privilege relative to other people. I pause and think about that. I am a Christian and a pastor. It is important that I value other people, listen to what they say, and repent of what should be repented of. It is true that I have been most fortunate in the circumstances of my birth and upbringing. I come from an intact two-parent family that valued education and had the means to help me go to college debt-free. I have not suffered from racial discrimination. Add to that that I had the good luck to be born in a safe town, free of warfare, without natural disasters, and with a low crime rate, and I admit that I hit the jackpot. I know that other people have had harder walks, I say. I've been lucky. I expect my candor to ease the tension. It does not. People are shaking their heads. Sit down, says a young person I do not know. Puzzled and embarrassed, I sit down. I have just had an encounter with something, and it's hard to name what that something is. You might call it applied postmodernism, which evolved from French deconstructionist thinkers of the late 20th century. You might call it that if you know what any of those words mean. Most people don't. Practitioners of this kind of theory, often they just call it that theory, are not playing the same game by the same rules on the same field that I am. I am appealing to our common humanity grounded in our value as individuals made and loved by God. They are not interested in that. They have alternate categories which focus mostly on difference. They look down on privilege and value only the voices of the marginalized, victimized people. To them, who you are matters more than what you say. The barriers and gaps between identity groups reveal all they need to know. Generalized statements are suspect, likely to be a form of verbal oppression from a dominant culture. 
I know I'm taking us on a bit of a tangent here. Let me try and circle back and close this loop. I said in the beginning of this sermon that some of you may have rolled your eyes on hearing the phrase, the promotion of social righteousness. It sounds suspicious. It has some words in common with some things that have made you uncomfortable, but it's kind of vague and fuzzy in your mind. That is because practitioners of this kind of theory, sometimes it's called critical theory, they often use the same words that I do, but they mean them in a different way. One book I read had to resort to the convention of using the phrase social justice capitalized to mean what those folks mean by social justice and social justice with small letters to mean what I mean by social justice. And you are right to find that confusing. I find it confusing and I've been reading books on it. All I really want you to take away from this sermon is an understanding that Different people mean different things when they talk about social justice and racism and the like. I and Martin Luther King Jr. and many others are pointing back to a grounding in our human rights and our intrinsic value as children of God. A great many, not all, modern university professors and queer theorists and the like are pointing to this other thing, which honestly is very hard to define. It's sort of designed that way. And we don't have time to go into that in any more detail this morning, but if any of you want some book or podcast suggestions, let me know, or we'll, we'll go out for coffee and have a proper chat about it. So how do I wrap this up? Let me just give you two simple pieces of advice, both of which are grounded on our heritage and our belief as Christians. First, as is the best practice when driving, look where you want to go rather than where you've already been. Imagine the kind of society you want to live in and do your best to move toward it. Ignore politicians, academics, and media personalities who want to spend all their time criticizing others and get you all riled up and upset. They are manipulating your emotions by stoking your resentments. Turn them off. Some reflections and learning about history, of course, are helpful, but you can't drive forward by only looking in the rearview mirror. Jesus acted as if the kingdom of heaven was already fully here. His actions demonstrated that. That is what he exhorted his disciples to do and empowered them to do. Which brings me to my second bit of advice. Remember that you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Live into your identity in Christ. That is our primary orientation, to be Christian. We do that by loving God and doing the other thing that is like loving God, loving our neighbor just as much as we love ourself, because, of course, God loves our neighbor. We will do that until God fully accomplishes our prayer, Thy kingdom come. Goodbye, my friends. Have a blessed day.